your name? David. Hey, everybody. How you doing? Who are you? Why aren't we charging people to enter and photograph the ruins of City Methodist Church down there? Two pictures here. On the left, everybody has this photograph. You and I do. City Methodist Church downtown, uh, built in uh, 1926, abandoned since 1975. On the right is a picture from 2000 when I visited North Yorkshire. Beautiful Wimpy Abbey. Um, Wimpy Abbey was uh, originally dates back to the 800s, but it was closed by Henry VIII in 1540 during the dissolution of the monasteries. It fell into private property over the centuries, and by 1920, it was in the hands of English Heritage, which is a charity, a public charity that preserves the heritage of England. If you want to visit the Whitby Abbey, I just checked this out. It's 11 pounds, which is 15 U.S. dollars. And if we were to go to City Methodist Church right now, I bet you we would find tourists in there. Objectively, it is one of the most visited structures in our city. And the people don't pay a penny to go in there and photograph. And I'll get to the consequences of that. But first, I've got to tell you, the looks on the faces of our city leaders a few years ago when at a meeting about City Methodist Church and what we're going to do about it. And I said, start charging people. I guess they weren't expecting from little rat hole me something so quaintly entrepreneurial. <laughs> and just to give you a context, I helped form a coalition that stopped the for-profit prison here a few months before that. They were not expecting me to come up and say, start charging people for the privilege. They look, really look surprised. But unfortunately, you know, it's a missed opportunity. At this point, it's very expensive to renovate. It'd be very expensive to tear down. And it would be very expensive if one of those tourists injured or killed himself in there, and we have liability come on. So it, it's a problem that we have. Uh, and it's a missed opportunity. Not only financially, 15 bucks a head, maybe a little less for beer residents, but it's also a missed opportunity at self-definition and self-determination. See, those tourists that go in there and take the photographs or whatever it is they do, um, they take the photograph, they put it on social media, they geotag it, it says Gary, it gets shared and repeated and retweeted, it's mean over and over and over. And what that does is eventually it becomes a symbol. It takes on a deeper meaning. It takes on a reality of its own. And so often it becomes one of the major symbols of our city for outsiders. And it's really problematic because in so many ways it's not symbolic of this city, especially over the past few decades. It's more than just some symbol of urban, uh, ruin or deindustrialization or any of that. You see what happened, why it closed, because in 1975, the congregation who was left refused to integrate, refused to welcome their black neighbors into Southern, and it's closed. This isn't simply some ruin to white white ruin, no, it's a symbol of white supremacy. And therefore, it has very little meaning to many of the people who live in this city, actually. But for outsiders, it's quite different. It's very frustrating when people, particularly from the outside, come to Gary, bring in all this stereotype and cliche, make some video, put it online, went to the worst parts of town, they get 100,000 views in a week. Meanwhile, folks here working on the ground put together really well-produced, do-it-yourself histories and cultures of our city, and we're lucky to get 100 views in a year. Very frustrating. But nevertheless, I believe the only way to counter these cliched, stereotyped, these misconstrued messages is to flood this out and just keep making our culture, keep telling our story. A few years, it was probably 10 years ago by this point, there was a journalist from Russia Today conducting some interviews out front of this church, some jazz about 
life in the declining United States, something like that. And as he was interviewing people of our historians, if you know this, you know across the street from this ruin is a school, 21st Century Charter School. You're going to meet here from one of their representatives after me. And as this interview was being conducted, all the school children come running out of school, excited, full of joy. I've seen it a few times, doing some work over at that school. It's a beautiful sight. And this producer turned around and told these kids, our children, to shut up. They were ruining his shop. Their life, their joy, was not helping him convey this message that he was trying to get across. So let's review. We have a foreign agent. We have some decontextualized garbage story. We have people yelling at school kids and taking away parking spots from the school workers, all because of this ruin that's just sitting there. By telling our own stories, we use our power. We use our power to shape the narrative and influence the narrative about our city. We exercise our self-determination. So let's review. So telling our Gary stories, where to go, where to start, let's review. I've been asked many times over the past decade about doing some sort of community history project. Usually it's an oral history project. But sometimes I think I might scare people off a little bit because many inquired, but few have actually executed. Nevertheless, we stand on the shoulders of giants in this city. And for a city its size, I, I do consider here to be a small city. There's nothing wrong with that. For a small city, there is so much history that has been written that we have available to us. And I want to begin by acknowledging two people in particular, two historians. And the first is Dolly Millender and the work that she did with the Gary Historical and Cultural Society. I'd also like to recognize her daughter, Naomi, the late Naomi Millender, who carried some of this on in her last few years. Their work appears all over the libraries and archives of this city. And there have been times where I've been looking for who was the city councilor this year, where was this business, and then I find this document that Dolly created decades ago, and I just thank her for that. The other is my friend Jim Lane, professor of emeritus history from here at IU, and my buddy Jimbo. For 50 years now, he's been publishing an oral history magazine, Steel Shavings, that's captured the stories of people here in the area. And he's continued this on ever since. Uh, documenting and journaling things that he sees. So that's some of what's available for us to start from. And I believe that the work of Dolly Millinder and Jim Lane need to be the starting points of all future inquiries into the history of here in Indiana. What they did, the approach they did, what they found, all of that. I want to acknowledge the two great repositories of history that we have in this city, not one but two. The first being the Indiana Room at the Gary Public Library and Cultural Center. Wonderful is back open again after being closed for so long. The other is the Calumet Regional Archives here at Indiana University of Northwest, where I've been researching for over 25 years. And I want to give a shout out to just two groups who are doing new things and have sprung up and are preserving the history, finding more stories, new interpretations. The first is uh, a very new group, the Gary Historical Collective, led by a young man named Corey Shepherd. You can find his works in the Northwest Indiana Times column. The other is Our Gary Stories, which is formed by Chris Harris, and I have to give full disclosure, me as well. You can find that online. Very easy to find both of these groups on the internet. Reach out to us. We love the dialogue. But you don't even need to join the group. This is something you, do, you can do for yourself. History doesn't belong to anyone or any group. It's collective. We can all chime into this story. So I want to close out by just giving a couple of quick directives. Like I said, I think sometimes I'll just go on about methods of doing history here and here. So if someone's looking for a place to start, where might that be? Where can you begin your review? Well, first of all, I find family history to be one of the most fascinating approaches for those who aren't doing the academic pursuit of history but are keeping it with the community. Family history enables us to find what I personally find one of the most fascinating things about the city, the people, and the history here, which is what I call the Gary origin stories. 
What brought you here? What brought your family here? What were the circumstances? These open up all kinds of lines of review and inquiry once you have that basic data uh, available to you. Oral histories, as I had mentioned before, um, it can be a lot more than just recording someone talking. There is a bit of a strategy to doing a good oral history, but what I find simply is that oral history does a great job of connecting personal histories to those broader political and economic and social histories. And it is also probably the best way to go out and prevent what are sometimes called the hidden or forgotten history. Why do things get forgotten? Well, there are ways to make sure that doesn't happen. <clears throat> and this is just scratching the surface of the stories that are available in Gary, Indiana. Finally, the last one that's become so much more accessible over the past few years as we have seen things like uh, Ancestry and these other paid subscription services that look into the city and genealogical records, and that's the history of your home. Census records, city directories, all of these things open that possibility of getting that tie into the history. So many places to get started with that. But I want to leave you with one thought when we talk about history. That propaganda, those decontextualized views, those outsiders, all that stuff's offered for free, and it's very easy to find, and it's a big part of why we have the trouble we have in society right now. So not only do we need to go out and do this work, we need to make sure that this work is as accessible as possible. A lot of this work is in print only. What we need to make sure that it's being updated into all the new formats, and that everybody has as much possibility as they can to access and learn from this. And that is my bedrock. Thank you for coming.